All right. Hello, church family. Uh, I am super excited and grateful for the opportunity that I have to uh, be here with you guys tonight, to be sharing with you. I want to remind you guys um, just to just be faithful to pray. Uh, as you guys know, pastors uh, had the opportunity to be out of town with his family, uh, be able to spend time with them. And uh, he has uh, embarked on his journey home. And so we're excited to have him back, but uh, be faithful to pray for him. I uh, pray the Lord will give him uh, uh, just patience uh, as, they're, as they're driving and uh, deliver them back here safely. And I will be looking forward to what the Lord does there. Also want to remind you guys, just be faithful to pray for our missionaries. Um, uh, this week, we're not highlighting any particular missionary, but just want to remind you, just to be faithful to pray for our missionaries. If you were here um, when we had our missions, uh, the, our international banquet, a uh, pastor preached a message from Romans chapter 15. And uh, I don't know if you guys took notes from that message, but honestly, that was one of the most helpful and practical messages that I ever heard uh, for praying for a missionary. And so I, I, I wrote it down on a, on a three by five card and I have that right next to my uh, missionary prayer card and I use that. Um, and basically the three things that he reminded us to pray for, I'll remind you this week, was uh, to, and this is in Romans 15, like you can see it right there in the text, that uh, he said, hey, pray that we'll be delivered from those who don't believe, pray that our work will be accepted of the saints, and pray that we'll uh, have rest together with you. And so I uh, pray for our missionaries, that God will keep them uh, safe from the walls of the devil. Many of our missionaries are in uh, creative access areas and places where the government isn't necessarily happy they're there, and there are, are people that would rise up against them. So pray that God will protect them from that. Pray that um, that as they labor, as they serve, that they'll have great influence with the believers there, that they'll, that they'll be accepted of the saints and pray that they'll be refre refreshed in the spirit, that God will uh, continue to strengthen them and encourage them every day. You know, the Bible tells us that our, there are outward man is perishing, that our inward man will be renewed uh, day by day. And so pray that for our missionaries. And uh, uh, last thing to pray for is uh, uh, also... Interns are, are uh, here, coming on the way. Um, Brother Antonio uh, moved in with me uh, this week already. And so uh, we've, uh, it's been an enjoyable time, definitely busy helping him get settled in and everything like that. Um, but uh, we have Brother Antonio's already here. Brother Conrad will be here uh, very shortly. And uh, when I come back, actually, he's coming in. And so I'll be praying for them and uh, definitely uh, be an encouragement to them when you see them. And uh, hopefully they will be a blessing to us as well. Tonight, uh, we're going to uh, continue to um, look at the Hall of Faith uh, found in Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, tonight we have a very familiar character, all right? Uh, someone that uh, many of us have uh, taught a Sunday school lesson about, maybe you learned about in Sunday school. Uh, maybe uh, there's whole books written that I've, I've read on, on this individual's life and character and qualities and attributes and and uh, admiring uh, just different things that the Lord did, and yet tonight, or, yeah, tonight we're going to see one uh, specific character quality that that earned him an honorable mention in this hall of faith. So, look at Hebrews chapter eleven. I encourage you uh, have your Bibles um, uh, out, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, you, you're at a place that you can. You know, if you're driving, just just drive. Don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> but uh, Hebrews eleven, uh, looking at verse twenty two tonight. The Bible says, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Okay, uh, so tonight we're going to look at Joseph. And really, uh, right here, God highlights the end of his life and says, hey, right here, uh, evidently at the end of his life, uh, he made mention of, of something that uh, gets him an honorable mention here. As we look at Joseph, think about Joseph's life. Again, he's super uh, familiar. Uh, we can talk about his faithfulness, his diligence, um, the, the fact that he's lived this commendable life and there's, there's qualities that we can emulate from him. And, and, and uh, you know, I may mention a few of those tonight, but um, you know, Genesis is 50 chapters long, okay? And uh, uh, I, I love the book of Genesis. I'm teaching the teens through Genesis right now uh, during our Sunday school time, and it's been a wonderful time there, but it's 50 chapters, okay? Um, and literally almost 10 of them, so almost 20% of the chapters in, in Genesis uh, deal with Joseph, his life, his influence, the things going on with him, okay? And so, and yet, despite that, God only gives him one verse in, in the 
his hall of faith in Hebrews. And so uh, it's very interesting, right? Um, uh, we, we'll see again uh, about his life and faith and all these things, okay? Uh, turn to Genesis 50. You can get your Bibles. Genesis 50 is where, again, there's only 50 chapters in Genesis. So it's this last chapter right at the end of Genesis that uh, recounts the end of Joseph's life, right? And so uh, uh, you hold there uh, Genesis 50, but we're going to just talk about his life for a second. Uh, we're first introduced to Joseph in Genesis chapter 30, right? And I say introduced, really, that all that happens is, is uh, he is born to his mother, Rachel. And, and it talks about, hey, he's born and that's it. It doesn't pick up his story again until uh, Genesis chapter 37. And we meet him as a 17-year-old uh, teenager, a 17-year-old man, um, young man. And uh, uh, what's he doing? Well, uh, he's, he's diligently working. Uh, he, he's out in the field. He's, uh, he's faithful, serving his dad, doing what he, what he ought to do. But the Bible would tell us that uh, Joseph, um, so Joseph, I said his mom was Rachel, right? Uh, as we know, Rachel had one more son after Joseph, and that was Benjamin. But she actually had passed away during childbirth, okay? And so uh, Jacob had loved his wife, and now his wife Rachel had given him Joseph and Benjamin. And so uh, he, loved these, he loved these sons, right? But the Bible says that he loved Joseph more than all the brothers, so much so, as we're familiar, uh, he, he's given a coat of many colors, and, and he's honored and kind of elevated to this position, right? And, and yet, uh, his brothers envied him for this, right? They, 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 they're moved with, with hatred and envy towards him, right? And, uh, and, and Joseph's in this position, he's just, he's just trying to be faithful. He's just doing what his dad tells him to do and serving diligently in the field, doing all these things. And yet, he finds himself in this hated position. And so God gives him a, a dream that, hey, like, you're going to be exalted, right? And, and, uh, and, and gives him this dream, and his brothers hate him even more for it. And so while he's there serving the field, he's pr probably still around that, like, 17 years old age. Uh, his dad calls him back and says, hey, go check on your brothers. You know, they're, they're, in, this, they're in this place. Uh, go there, check on them, do all these things. And, and he's faithful. He goes, follows through, uh, goes the extra mile, as it were, and, and does what his dad told him to do. And yet... As, again, many of us are familiar, uh, his brothers, they connive together and they uh, devise a plan to kill their brother, right? Um, and they were going to kill Joseph for their hatred for him. And one brother says, oh, no, 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 let's not kill him. Let's, uh, here, behold, here comes some, some Egyptians. Uh, we can sell him uh, as a slave. And so uh, they do. They, they sell him um, and he... Uh, um, he's sold as a slave into Egypt. When he gets into Egypt, uh, he's purchased by a guy named Potiphar, and uh, uh, he serves in Potiphar's house. And he gets there, and he just gets to work, right? Uh, he's not boohooing and crying about his circumstances or, or the things going on. It, evidently, he just gets to work and gets busy working. And, and Potiphar gets to notice him. He says, man, if, if Joseph puts his hand to something, it's... It, all of a sudden, it's blessed. It, you know, maybe, uh, hey, if he works with the cattle, all of a sudden, the cattle are just abundantly reproducing, right? If he, if he works with the crops, it's, it, it's all these things. And so, so Potiphar says, man, if, if everything's blessed under Joseph's hands, I'll put my whole house under his hands so that my whole house can be blessed and, and have this favor of, of Joseph's God, right? And, and he does. And so uh, Joseph's there serving, and he's elevated in this position. He's, he's, he, he's serving in Potiphar's house, doing all these things. And then we're introduced to Potiphar's wife, and she desires Joseph to have a to have an intimate relationship with Joseph, and and Joseph is is he's taken aback. He's he's like, you know, lady, your husband's given all these things into my hand, his whole house, and uh, he's kept you from me because you're his wife. Like I'm not I'm not going to do this. And then and then she continues after him, and finally he says, how could I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? He's, he's not gonna he's not gonna cave to this type of temptation again uh, commendable quality right he he had a had a fear of the Lord that that uh, influenced his actions and his decisions and he wasn't gonna cater to some um, to some this type of temptation right and so much so that he he fled and ran from this temptation uh, amazing amazing act of faith right remember Hebrews only gives him one verse had nothing to do with this this account right um, but Potiphar's wife. She made a false accusation against Joseph, saying, oh, he had come in here. He was, he was the, um, the initiator. He wanted this, and, and he, um, uh, yeah, he, he, he laid with me, 
inappropriately and and um and makes his accusation and potiphar i mean it's it's even though joseph had been exalted and he had a, he had a love for joseph and and had given all these things ultimately it's his wife and the slave so the slave goes to prison and joseph finds himself in prison having done nothing wrong again joseph being the kind of man he was uh he he was just there faithful doing the next right thing making the next right decision and and again, the, the guards in the prison, they notice and they see, man, Joseph, Joseph's doing a good job. He's, he's doing as he ought to do. And they start exalting him and giving him responsibilities and to the point where Joseph was over the other prisoners and, and he was serving there within the prison. And, uh, and uh, here's a principle from Joseph's life. Again, not, not necessarily part of the, uh, what is commended in, about faith, but um, Joseph was diligent. He was a worker. He didn't always seek promotion. He just did the work that was set before him. I've heard this principle said many times, and I found it to be true. You know, good workers get hours and they get raises, right? And maybe you start somewhere, uh, maybe right now you're like, man, I'm, I'm only on the schedule, you know, 25 hours a week. And I, like, I need more hours or, or all these things, right? Um, yeah, like, like, you know, ask around, whatever, whatever, but be diligent, be faithful because you know, uh, that the other person they're giving hours, if you're outworking them and you're outshining them and you're making the company money and you're making decisions and you're doing the right thing on your shift, they're going to want you there. They're going to, they're going to give you the hours that you need, right? Uh, you don't have to, you know, uh, push and claw and fight for a raise every single year. No, be diligent, be faithful. And God is the rewarder of, of that type of work, right? And Joseph is an example of that. Good workers get hours and raises, okay? Um, again, that's kind of a, a freebie uh, that, that was given to me that I wanted to share with you guys um, to just be faithful, okay? So he's there in the prison. He's, he's exalted in prison. And uh, while he's there, um, I remember years ago, God had given him a dream that he would one day be exalted, right? And, and God gave him that interpretation. Now he finds himself in the prison and, and these guys come down from Pharaoh's, ha- from Pharaoh's house and they themselves had had some dreams while they were in the prison. And, and uh, Joseph interprets the dreams for them and, and says, hey, uh, you, you're going to be restored to your position. You, you're going to have your head cut off, right? And uh, or you're going to be hung and, 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 uh, and this is what's going to happen, right? And he, uh, he lays it out and it happens exactly like, like Joseph said. And Joseph had told him, hey, don't forget me when you go back to Pharaoh's house, right? You're going to be restored to your position. But when you're there, talk, talk to Pharaoh about me. And uh, yet the guy is restored to his position and forgets, about, forgets all about Joseph. So Joseph is left in the prison, left to be diligent, left to be faithful, yet left to keep this right character and walk with God. Then Joseph, um, and then Pharaoh actually, Pharaoh's the, the king, as it were. Pharaoh is like the guy in Egypt, okay? He dreams a dream and he is troubled by this dream. He doesn't know what it means. He's, he's like, hey, what's, you know, what's the deal, right? And so he asks, he asks everybody, hey, uh, tell me uh, the interpretation of this dream. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? And people, uh, they, they're, they're not able to give him a, uh, an answer that satisfies him. He's like, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't think this is right. And so uh, now, all of a sudden, remember the guy that, that had been restored and, and Joseph remembered his dreams? He remembers now. He goes, oh, actually, you remember, you remember Pharaoh back whenever you, you, know, you sent me to prison and, and killed another guy? Uh, we had dreams while we were there, and this guy, Joseph, was the guy. So Pharaoh goes, well, bring him in. Like, let me talk to him, and, and maybe he can figure this out. And so they bring Joseph in to Pharaoh, right? And, and Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams, and he tells Pharaoh, he says, hey, um, this, is, this is the dream. Know this first. It's not about me. It's not about my greatness, but there's a God in heaven, right? Who, who, who does th- this types of things, right? And so he, he gives God the glory and he uh, interprets this dream and says, hey, there's going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of great famine. And Pharaoh goes, man, well, if he has, if he has this much wisdom and this much understanding and he can interpret these dreams, who better to manage my household and prepare the land of Egypt for this famine? And so he immediately promotes Joseph, gives him all this responsibility, all this power, all this authority. And so Joseph is taxing the people, building these storehouses, putting all the corn and, and, and saving it back and gathering in the days of plenty, preparing for the days of famine. And he does this. Um, and um, all the while, as he's working, as he's building, as he's doing these things, 
remember his brothers were were back in uh, back in Canaan land, right? They, they're they're back in um, back in the land and, and, and serving under their father and, and, and evidently you know going on with their life. Uh, they had they had led led their father to believe that that Joseph had been killed and so he had grieved his son and and, and had sorrowed and, and gone through all these things, right? So Joseph's over here doing this. They're over here doing that. Now when the famine hits, Egypt is prepared. They have all this corn stored up. They're they're selling it to the people, and they're and they're able to do this so much. So they're selling it to other nations around. And and Jacob, Joseph's dad, uh, and and his all of his brothers, they kept they catch wind of this, saying, "Hey, there's corn in Egypt. Hey, we can go buy there." And so J- so Jacob sends his son and says, "Hey, you guys go and buy." And so what do they do? Well, they go talk to Joseph, right? And yet they don't recognize him. Or whenever he left them, he was 17 years old about, right? And now here we are all these years later, um, you know, uh, we'll say about 15 years later, um, seemingly, um, I was reading um, about this and some people think he's around 30, right, uh, when this happens. And so uh, they, they come back and they're, um, they're there with him and, and they meet with him and, and now Joseph has this opportunity. He... He's the second in command in Egypt. And now his brother's going to come back and ask, ask to buy corn from him. No, he, his question was, hey, how's, how, do, you, do you have any brothers left, right? Who, who's not here? And they mentioned, uh, remember I said, Joseph had a little brother, Benjamin, and his mom had died during childbirth. He asks him about Benjamin because they had left Benjamin at home. And uh, remember, uh, Jacob had loved Rachel. And the one son from Rachel had already died. And so he's not going to send the only son left from Rachel uh, on this mission to go buy the corn. He's like, no, like, like leave him here, right? Um, and so Joseph sends him back and says, hey, go bring your other brother here and uh, I'll, I'll sell you corn, okay? Enough. Um, and so uh, Jacob's not happy about it, all these things. And, and finally follows through. Whenever they bring Benjamin and all these things, Joseph reveals himself to them, right? Again, they didn't recognize. Uh, he reveals himself and uh, sins for his dad. And so Jacob brings all of his family into Egypt, okay? And uh, uh, brings them there. And uh, uh, you can read about it. Uh, you know, Exodus chapter one tells you about all the all the sons, all the people, all that all, everybody that came in. Um, but here in Genesis 50, so Genesis 49, Jacob had moved his whole family in and uh, everybody's there. And uh, Jacob ends up, talking about each of his sons, blessing them, and then ends up dying in Genesis 49. So now we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 50, um, a couple different things. And remember this whole story, if you look at verse, um, uh, it's verse 20, right? Super familiar verse here in Genesis 50, 20, about this whole story, this whole scenario, right? It was his brothers that had sold him into slavery. It was, uh, Joseph was wronged on every single front. And time and time again, it seemed people were coming against him. Problems were coming against him. All these things, right? He had just chosen to be faithful. Verse 20, he says, but as for you, he's talking to his brothers, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive, right? Now, therefore, fear ye not, because I will nourish you and your little ones and be comforted. And he spake, and spake kindly unto them, okay? So that's an amazing statement. He's like, look, I trust the sovereignty of God. Uh, you, you, know, you thought this was all for evil, but God meant it for good. That's an amazing statement. Uh, when we go through things, we don't always have the right view of our own trials. Joseph had the right view of the things that he had gone through in his life. And yet, that's not what's commended. What's commended is what happened next. Look at verse 22. And Joseph, he dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children, this is his, Ephraim was his son. Uh, And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Mature, the son of Manasseh, uh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees, right? So he's saying like, hey, his grandkids, he was around for his grandkids. They were brought up on his knees, okay? He was 110 years old. Uh, uh, he, had, he had sons, he had grandbabies, he had uh, all these things. Verse 24, and Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God, this is what he says, will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. 
And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being a hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. How was it that Joseph had so much confidence that they would in fact be visited, that they would be delivered out of Egypt, that, that, that this would happen and they would be able to carry his bones away? It wasn't because there were a lot of open doors. It wasn't because he had some great feeling. It wasn't because he heard some preacher say so. It was because God had promised. Joseph had a wonderful, amazing faith in God's word. Remember in, in Genesis chapter 12, uh, we're introduced to uh, what's known as the Abrahamic covenant. God gave an unconditional covenant. There was no strings attached saying, hey, I will do this. Uh, and he told Abraham and he promised him uh, a land, a seed, and a blessing, right? There were three things a part of this covenant. And Joseph, evidently back whenever he was with his, with his family, again, during those 17 years, had learned, hey, this is what God promised our family. God told Abraham about this covenant starting in, in Genesis chapter 12, and he confirmed it time and time again just with Abraham. And then when Isaac comes around, that's Abraham's son, uh, he, in Genesis chapter 26, you can look at it, Genesis 26, verse 3 at, through 5, he confirms his covenant there to Isaac, right? And then Jacob, again, Joseph's dad, he confirms the covenant again. So generation after generation after generation, God is telling them, hey, this is my covenant to you. This is what I'm going to do. And Joseph knew the word of God and had confidence in what God had said. God had promised and Joseph knew that God was faithful to keep his word because God had made an unconditional promise uh, and, and, and pr that God was going to keep his promise. So Joseph, at the end of his life, uh, he, didn't, he wasn't commended in right now for the fact that he had dreams, that he was diligent, that he was faithful, that he was a hard worker. No, he had faith in God's word. He had faith in what God had said. And he had a wonderful relationship to God's word. The question for us is, um, how is your relationship to what God has said? Uh, how are you interacting with God's word? Uh, when you have decisions to make, um, where are you looking? Are you looking to uh, some dream, some experience, some book? Or are you looking to God's perfect word? Joseph knew God's word. Joseph made his last final decisions based on what God had promised. And so the encouragement to us is, hey, just like Joseph, um, we too uh, can, uh, can place our faith in God's word because God, uh, he cannot lie, right? Look at it again. Hebrews eleven twenty two. as we close. By faith, Joseph, when he died, he made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and he gave commandment concerning his bones. Uh, God's word informed Joseph's decision, and God's word should inform ours as well.